All right, guys. Well, uh, good, good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I, I hope that you are uh, ho uh, soon uh, and about to solve the project number six. Uh, so any, any, anything that you may want to discuss with me about that one? I thought it was on Wednesday. I guess we were saying Thursday last week. I remember Thursday. I think it's Wednesday. Wednesday, right? And it must have been selected here. Yeah, I think it's Wednesday. So, so what, what, what is the issue? What is the issue with the, with the homework? It's just a lot of work. It, it's a lot of work, right? Uh, but. Uh, but it's just uh, coding, right? It's just coding, and uh, let me. No, actually, no. I sent you an email about this, but uh, now I have the equations, all the equations here. Uh, but I mean, it probably it's, I don't know, 50 lines, something like that. Uh, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit more, <laughs> because Okay, let's go deviated world boards. And next. So so you know you know about this, right? The delta and the phi, you know how to do that. Uh, then just have to you put a matrix, matrix multiplication. You already had that from before. So this this is something that you already have, right? It's just you have to make then a for loop as a function of deviation and as a function of azimuth. You make that for loop and calculate points at every single point. Uh, for example, I think, let's see. Uh, I, I'll come back to the for loop later, okay? So you, you get this, you calculate those with just straight out of these equations. You calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix, a two by two matrix. Uh, of these ones, or you can just write the equations, and and you check whatever failure criterion you are checking, tensile strength or shear, around the wellbore. Usually, th there are two ways of, to do this. You could either find the exact point where you have shear failure, uh, but that usually would take some other loop to, f to look for that. Usually what I do is, I just calculate these two everywhere around the wellbore, and I check everything around the wellbore uh, about what's going on. So it's going to be three loops. The first loop, let me go to the next one. The first loop, let's say, for example, that goes uh, from deviation 0 to 90. That's one loop. The other loop goes from theta from 0 to, say, 180, or you want to do everything, to 360. That's the second loop. And the third loop will consist on going all around the wall of the wellbore, from 0 to 360 degrees. So there you have three loops, uh, three ne nested loops. And, uh, and then you check for uh, failure all around the wellbore, and that's going to allow you to make this plot. So le let me zoom a little bit to see at least, you know, how you could solve it. You don't have to do it like this, but you could solve it like that. In this case, what I have done is, y you see how it gets coarser as, as it gets further away from the center? That be that's because I have 360 points over here. and Well, not 360. I think I have 36. Or, no, probably a bit more than that. Probably 360 around here, and I have, an, and this one from 0 to 90, so it's a matrix of 90 by 360, all of this. Uh, it, it will take some time, but your computers are very fast, so, so you, you, you will get to, to solve it in, in a few minutes. Usually, to me, to run all of this, uh, it takes probably 30 seconds or so since I hit the enter, uh, because it's three nested loops plus eigenvalues calculation, so that it takes some time, but, but it's just 30 seconds. It's not, not, not a lot. Uh, yes, John? I'm trying to see, where does the, the loop that goes around the wellbore show up on here? So you see, you, like, you see the azimuth of the inclination. 
Yeah. So, uh, so let's go up here. So we we agree that the first the first two loops no 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 where where am I getting? I mean you're just looking for the maximum, right? Just looking for the maximum. So like what you each of the points you're putting in the the spherical the lower sphere projection plot yeah. is the maximum unconfined strength you require. Yes. So when you're doing your loop around the well board, you're looking for that. You're just looking for the maximum. Yes. Loop, and that's yes. The yeah. So so one loop. You yeah you can do half, but but what I mean with the loop I mean just one more for loop. No no not I don't mean with the loop like go around something but I mean I mean a logical uh, <laughs> loop a uh, for loop. So one is for the deviation, uh, one is for the asymptote of, of the world board, and the third one is to go around this uh, circle that will be that theta. So that's, that's will be, that will be the third one. Okay? And then you just check uh, for the maximum value or whatever if you're doing, uh, I think I asked you late criterion and uh, I1J2 criterion. So just check for that and then you get your answer. Okay? All right, uh, so I, uh, I wanted to tell you something else about this homework. I just remembered. In this example, uh, it's, I think it's the same as the one that you're doing in the homework. Uh, this solution that you get for UCS, this is the easiest one. Try to do this one first. And this is for breakout angle. But I think that for your rock, your rock, it's a little bit weaker than this. So if, if for some of those solutions you get your breakout angle is uh, 180 degrees in every direction, that, if that's your solution, that's okay. Okay, just report that. Okay? And uh, because you may get for some orientation, especially for reverse faulting, in which uh, in the assignment those stresses are too high, you may get that it's not stable for any direction at all. Uh, but if you get that, that solution that uh, I'm telling you from now that, that that could be okay, all right, according to those stresses. Okay, so an anything else? Anything else about this project I could help you with? Yeah, Lily, you have a question? Yeah. So, for example, this is telling you what is the, the breakout width as a function of orientation. So, here it's all zero. Here it's about 40 to 50. So, you, you can predict what is going to be the width of the, of the breakout according to orientation. For that one, I do not recommend that, that you find an equation as we did before. Or, or as, uh, well, actually, we didn't do it, but I asked you to read in the notes that you can derive a closed form solution for that. I would rather, for that third loop, I will calculate everywhere where the Mohr circle is outside the failure surfaces, and I will consider that as failed rock, and that will go into calculation of the breakout angle. So just check where you have failure. If you do have failure, consider that into the breakout. No, you, you don't have to do that. You, you just, uh, let me see. I think I, I did something like that last time. Uh, basically, what you do is, uh, oh, wait a minute. I don't know what happened with the camera now. I now have to use this. So for any section in the world board, what you can do is 
at the wall of the wellbore, you check for the state of the stress all around the wellbore. Let's say this, this is theta. And you check if there is failure here, you can doubt as failure. Let's say that there is failure there, failure there, and there is no failure anymore. And probably you will get to this point and you will see failure again. And as you continue over here, you see failure over here. So wherever you see failure, that is going to be your breakout angle. You just check where there is failure, where there is not. And when there is failure, that contributes to, to your breakout angle. Okay. So 180 degrees means the whole circle has failed? Yes. 180 degrees means failure everywhere. OK. All right, guys. Um, so let, let's continue. We have a lot of things to do today. And we're going to talk about something that uh, not many of you may have seen before. So many of the things that we have discussed, probably you saw some of that in some form before. But, but now we're going to talk about a new thing. Uh, before I do that, um, I remember about this. We talked about failure surfaces, right? And now we put everything together, uh, a tensile criterion, a shear criterion, and a compression yield criterion. Uh, in this case, we have put this into a two-dimensional plot, but uh, you should be able also to recognize these failure surfaces uh, or yield surfaces as you may see them in papers or in books. So if I were to put now these combined yield surfaces into a a principal stress plot, it will look something like something like that. Uh, you, you see, the, this is one example where now you have these yield surfaces. Uh, th here, this is a hydrostatic axis, and these are the principal stresses. But this one doesn't have a cap. Let me look one with a cap. OK, this one is a good one. Uh, what happened there? This one. Uh, so, yes, the cap will be for the compression. So, now in this case, you know, y we see a summary of almost all the services we saw. Uh, this one, which one was this one? There's a von Mises, Tresca, uh, Morculum, Drucker Prager. Uh, this one, it's a sort of a Morculum, but with a curve. Uh, surface, and this is the last thing that we saw. This is a combined uh, shear surface with a cap. In this case, this cap is kind of a, you see, it's a pointy cap. Sometimes this is not very realistic. So instead of that, you have this other smoothed cap. Um, it's perpendicular, the plane, the surface is perpendicular to the hydrostatic axis at that point. And th but this is exactly what we have seen so far with uh, this type of, of model. So that cap over here is this cap over there, but now in three dimensions. Uh, all, all these failure surfaces or yield surfaces, they're going to tell you what is the limit uh, for the possible state of stress in the, in the case of the failure surface and the limit for the elastic strains in the case of the yield surface. So um, our point now is going to be to calculate what is beyond the yield stress. So this reminds me, you know, the question of, do you know if there is life after death? I, 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 I don't know. Uh, but our question is, is there strains after the yield point? Are there changes of stress after the yield point? Because many times uh, we stop looking at uh, considering geomechanics uh, when we get to the yield point. But now we're going to go into a very risky trip 
into going beyond the yield point. And we're going to see what, what happens beyond the yield point and how we can calculate the stress after that yield point. Uh, so our uh, objective here is going to be to predict plastic strains. And as, as you may uh, uh, guess, these plastic strains are going to be linked with uh, the state of stress. Um, particularly, changes in plastic strain are going to be linked to changes in stress. Uh, and now, we're going to do something with that we couldn't do before or or we're not going to be allowed to do something that we were doing before. Because before, by assuming linearity, we had a unique relationship between strain and stress. But now that we go into plasticity, uh, we're going to have strains that are uh, not recoverable, and that's not going to be a linear problem anymore. And because of that, we cannot link absolute strains to absolute stresses. Now we have to link changes of strain to changes of stress. So we'll go step by step. Uh, so um, into predicting these plastic strains, uh, we're going to, uh, to make some assumptions. And these are going to be the, we're going to still be working with small strains. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a continuous strain field. Uh, we're go also going to assume that this is rate independent uh, plasticity. And what that assumes is that it's no matter what the velocity of the loading is, the strength of the material is going to be the same. Which by now is, we know that that's something which is not true. Okay? Uh, but we're going to assume that uh, in order to simplify a little bit uh, our equations. So there are going to be six, five, uh, five main points that we're going to, to postulate in order to, to be able to derive these equations. And th those are uh, not, not really assumptions, but, but just key points that we should keep in mind as we continue talking uh, about plasticity. The first one is something that we already know, and that is in order to consider what's after the yield point, we need to have a yield criterion, right? And this is something we have already seen. Uh, it's basically telling you when there is failure and when there is not, or when, or when there is actually yield, okay? We're gonna make a difference between yield and failure uh, a little bit later. Uh, so such a yield criterion might be a function f of the strain tensor that tells you when you get to yield. Uh, so it's just a function. So it's just a function that's stress or strain? Uh, stress. Did I say strain? You said, yeah, you said no, a function of the stress, of the stress tensor. Uh, and uh, basically that's going to tell you when you reach yield. And that can be an equation of shear failure, of tensor failure, of anything. It's just something that limits the attainable <coughs> elastic strains. Second, we need something which is called a hardening rule. Or sometimes, or most times, this is linked to strain. And this hardening rule is going to tell you how this yield parameter changes as a function of plastic strain. So now this is not a constant anymore. Before, for example, uh, let's imagine that we say this is tensile strength. Tensile strength was a constant, or UCS was a constant. But now, this parameter is not a constant anymore. Now this parameter is going to be a function of the plastic strains with the superscript P for, for plastics. For plastic, and, and remember, now this is a variable. And it's called a hardening rule because uh, 
some of these materials, they may get stronger or harder as you apply a change of a plastic strain, or sometimes they may also get weaker or soften as you change the plastic strain. Yes, Robert. Is it a function of the plastic strain tensor, or is it like a maximum strain? Uh, it's going to be a function of the accumulated plastic strain. We're going to get more in detail about that a little bit later on, but for now, let's, let's just in general think about plastic strain as, as one quantity, uh, which is a scalar. Uh, because we're going to see that sometimes that depends on the deviatoric plastic strain or, the, or on the volumetric plastic strain. So, so I don't want to get into details right now, but let's just say a plastic strain, okay? Um, the third thing that we need is now that we're talking about strains, is to have and assume that we can do in strain decomposition. And what that means is that our total strains are going to be a summation and we can separate this between elastic strains and plastic strains. So uh, according to this rule, I could calculate my elastic strains with my elastic theory and I can I can calculate separately my plastic strains with the plasticity theory. How do I calculate the plastic strains? And this is where uh, we get into, uh, into something new. Uh, we need what is called a plastic flow rule. Basically, this is going to be an equation that allows you to calculate plastic strains as a function of variations of the stress tensor. So the variations in plastic strains, they are going to depend on the variations of the stress tensor. So I know that the, now this looks like very abstract, but we're going to get into examples uh, of all of these things as uh, as we continue, okay? So so don't don't worry if if this seems too abstract for you right now. And the five key point is that also we need to make an assumption about the elastic unloading and what that means is you look I have it over here once we go beyond the yield point, we need to know what happens when we unload because that unloading, it's, it's something that is not pretty specified what's going to be. It's going to be, uh, it's going to have the same slope of the loading or not. That's something that, that we need to know as well. Uh, so uh, with all these elements, uh, now uh, we, uh, we are in conditions to, to go into the plasticity theory and to make some examples. And we're going to start with the most simple example of plasticity. Sometimes it's not very accurate, uh, but it, it's good to, to get started. And that's going to be the Morculum criterion. So Morculum, as we know, we use it uh, as a uh, failure criterion. And can you tell me what is the Mohr Coulomb equation? So one version is this, and where this is S0, and here is mu times sigma n, right? And what is the other version in terms of principal stresses? Sigma 1 is equal to what happens if sigma 3 is equal to 0? You measure the unconfined compressive strength, right? Since we're going to talk about yield, let me change this from unconfined compression strength to unconfined compression yield, okay? 
Usually with strain, we mean the, the peak point, the highest attainable stress. But now I'm going to set this as the yield stress, the point at which you start to have uh, plastic strains. Uh, all right, so this equation, if I were to make a plot, and this is sigma 3, and this is uh, sigma, y, sigma 1, which is going to be a line where that point there is this intercept and uh, the slope is equal to Q, all right? So uh, we, we know that, right? Uh, okay, so let's go to the next step. Uh, I can define this yield function uh, to be equal to zero whenever I have failure. And if I do that, I will define this f as sigma 1 minus uci minus q sigma 3, right? Whenever that gets equal to zero, uh, that means that I'm, I'm at the yield line. Uh, so uh, let's see. Um, imagine that I have a piece of prismatic rock. And I have here sigma 1. I have here sigma 2. And I have here the minimum principal stress, sigma 3. How is this rock going to, to fail? What is going to be the plane of shear failure? Um, it's going to be a plane which is a kind of a combination of those two, right? And it's going to contain the intermediate principal stress. And what about what is going to be the angle between that plane and this plane? So I'm, go I'm going to draw what you said. It's going to be a plane like this. And this part is going to move down. This one is going to move up. And that angle, let's say beta, is going to be equal to 45 degrees plus the friction angle divided by 2. Uh, th th this is not very important now, but uh, but j j just keep it in mind, okay? Uh, okay, so now, now we're getting into the plastic strains, okay? So if this one moves down, and uh, what's going to be the plastic strain in direction one? So let's say that I get to the yield at the point somewhere over here. Is the plastic strain going to be in the direction of sigma 1? Uh, I'm, look, the stress is going in this direction. And it is a compression force. Uh, is the element going to get bigger or shorter in this direction? Can you see it's going to get shorter? Because this one is going down, this one is moving up, so it's going to get shorter. So you're going to have like in a, a compression uh, strain of a plastic compression strength. After you get to failure, this is going to still deform if you continue pushing. Uh, probably it would be easier to see if instead of what I did over there, you were to imagine that the plane is somewhere over there. So as, as this plane mo moves down and this one goes up, this is going to be still a compression. Okay, so what that means is that you're going to have a component of plastic strain in direction one, which is going to be aligned with the direction of the compression, sigma one. You see that one goes in that direction. So uh, here I'm plotting a vector of plastic strain. What about 
the plastic strain in direction three or in direction of sigma three, are you going to have a contraction or a dilation? It's going to be dilation. It's going to be opposite to that, right? C can you see that? So this one's moving down. This one's moving that. So it, it's going to dilate in that direction. And because of that, uh, we're going to have here a uh, a plastic strain that in direction three that's going to be opposite to the axis of the stress and it's going to be this plastic strain in direction three. And those two plastic strains uh, are going to be uh, linked and are going to be related uh, because those two are going to depend on a vector normal to that uh, yield surface. So you draw a vector normal to the yield surface and that vector is going to give you the relative quantity, the relative relationship, relationship between these two strains. So um, I tried to explain a little bit graphically how this would be, but we're going to see now into equations, so then you see a little bit more clearly. Uh, before we go to that, what's going to be the strain in direction two? Zero. Zero. It's going to be zero. So in order to capture uh, this type of uh, plastic deformation, uh, we have an equation which is called the flow rule equation that tells you that the increments in plastic strain are going to be proportional to the quantity uh, d lambda and they are going to go into the direction normal to the yield surface. So this equation is a flow rule. Uh, you, you, you're going to see how it makes sense, okay? Pro probably it doesn't make a lo lot of sense right now, but uh, we're going to see how it makes sense. What is, we know what is epsilon uh, because those are the strains. This is just a parameter. Okay, uh, don't worry about that one right now. This is uh, stress, and this F is your yield surface. Okay, so uh, let's, according to that rule, uh, let's compute uh, what is uh, going to be 